Uh, good afternoon. Today is a really good afternoon for uh, science in the state of Washington and uh, action in the state of Washington. First, on the science front, we want to congratulate the brilliant Washingtonians who have helped our mission to Mars. Uh, this is yet another day recognizing uh, the creative genius we have in the state of Washington, uh, for which we're so thankful. Uh, we're thankful to the people at, uh, at uh, Aerojet, Rocketdyne, and Redmond, who have provided uh, the, uh, the motors, the rockets, uh, to guide multiple of our explorations of, of the cosmos. This is another yet incredible success of their amazing technology to always be there for every mission uh, on time at just the right nanosecond. So congratulations to the folks in Redmond. The imaging instruments for the Perseverance were designed in part by the University of Washington team led by Tim uh, Elam. Congratulations to the Huskies. The camera used, which is amazing, which is an essentially controlled from Washington State, as I understand it, was designed in part by Western Washington uh, personnel and students led by Melissa Rice and her team, including students. So the big day for Washington State uh, and our species and its continued exploration. It's a big day for the science of our efforts to defeat climate change. Our nation has again joined the rest of the world in our leadership capacity to again re, uh, rejoin the Paris Agreement. Uh, this is the right thing for America. We are a leading scientific nation. This will allow us again to join the world and lead the world in the develop a, development of a clean energy economy. Congratulations to our nation to get back to the rightful place leading the world in this regard. Now, it's also a day for action. Today, I'm signing House Bill 1368, which is taking early action by the legislature that I appreciate to provide a relief, to re provide recovery and resilience to help Washingtonians across these troubled waters during the COVID pandemic. And because this is emergency legislation, it will take place immediately. As you know, the focus this year is relief, recovery, and resilience. And this uh, legislation will make big progress in all three. Washingtonians have been exemplary, leading the country in the fight against the COVID pandemic. And we've had uh, actually big success in that regard. But it has not come without economic and emotional costs associated with fighting a pandemic. But this process of getting to a post-pandemic era has just begun. And we intend to come out of this pandemic stronger, in part because of this legislation. This legislation continues much of the work that I and others have started in the months past. In December, I asked the legislature to act early on COVID relief legislation, which they have done with this bill. I want to go through some of the investments it makes in helping Washingtons, Washingtonians across these troubled waters. The bill allocates $714 million of assistance to K through 12 schools. And we are seeing progress in our schools, quite a number of our schools going back to on-site uh, education, which we're very appreciative of. It also allocates $618 million for our public health response to the pandemic. This includes money for testing, for investigation, for contact tracing, and funding for our ongoing vaccination efforts, which are uh, accelerating dramatically. The bill also dedicates $365 million for emergency eviction, rental and utility assistance. This helps families to avoid homelessness. It helps landlords to continue the stream of revenue they need and it's the right time to be doing it to help people who've had such difficulty during this pandemic. It also importantly provides $240 million for business assistance grants. As you know, I have started that effort uh, with tens of millions of dollars uh, I essentially was able to uh, distribute, but now we needed legislative assistance and I wanna thank legislators for that business assistance to help the businesses that have had real difficulties while we've done necessary actions to stem this pandemic and save lives. We have saved thousands of lives 
in Washington State, and I'm hoping this now helps thousands of businesses. This also provides $50 million for child care, $26 million for food banks and other programs, $91 million for income assistance, and that includes $65 million for help for our immigrant uh, Washingtonians, uh, which is so important in many, many parts of our state. I want to thank legislators. They've acted early on this, and we've got good leadership, including Senator Rolfus and Re Representative Ormsby, who've helped lead this effort. I'm happy to listen to my senator, Senator Rolfus. Senator. Senator Rolfus, do we have you? I'm waiting to be unmuted. I'm waiting to be unmuted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Governor Inslee. Um, thank you for including me today. Um, it, it's a it's always disappointing that we can't be at bill signings in person to celebrate all the work that that has that went into doing the bills. This particular effort started the last week of December. The legislature um, started working, as you referenced, Governor, even before the legislative session started in January. And here we are six weeks later with a bill to be signed by the governor. It, that kind of shows you how quickly and how slowly the democratic process works. But I'm pleased that we were able to get this bill to you. The importance of this bill um, can't be understated, really. It is a, um, we are early distributing the federal funds that were sent to us by Congress rather than waiting for the budget process to, um, to continue. We're getting the money out right now instead of waiting until May. And this is going to provide a critical link, as you said, um, Governor Inslee, for landlords and renters, for preventing homelessness, and for making sure the Department of Health has the resources it needs right now to effectively and efficiently get those vaccines out throughout the state, and while continuing the contact tracing and testing that we know what we're going to continue to need to do. Um, so this was an effort among Democrats and Republicans, the House and the Senate, the legislature and the executive branch, and it is an example of all of us pulling together to get the job done for our communities. So thank you. I'm, I'm looking, I'm hoping that you're signing it right now. Are you signing it or taking notes on my, um, on my talk? I always take notes when you speak, Senator. I don't want to forget a word of your presentation. So, <laughs> but I will we'll turn it over to you. Thank you for inviting me. We have a Ways and Means Committee going on right now, so thank I you. will duck out shortly. Thanks, Senator. Now, Senator Orms, or Representative Ormsby. So Representative Ormsby can't join us right now. He's in another meeting. I do want to point out that legislators did not wait for the legislative session. They have been working on this work before the legislature started the session. That has allowed us to do this early in the session before the final budget. So I want to thank them uh, for this. We also want to thank uh, our federal partners, uh, the U.S. Congress, uh, this is federal dollars, and we're making sure they're invested wisely in the state of Washington. We appreciate that. With that, I'm happily signing House Bill 1368, and I know it's going to help a lot of Washingtonians. And with that, we are going to uh, celebrate some good work and more work to come. We're not done. We should note that there's another budget to come, and... Uh, there's going to be a lot of other good news uh, in, the, in the months to come as we work on the final budget for the state of Washington. Okay, now we have Senate Bill 1095. Oh, excuse me, House Bill 1095, excuse me. House Bill 1095, I'm going to sign this in a moment. This bill ensures that individuals and businesses don't have to pay state taxes on COVID-19 emergency assistance grants. This will help them receive the most possible benefits from this money. Uh, co uh, Prime Sponsor Representative Whalen. And I have signed House Bill 1095. We now have House Bill 1367. This bill modifies funding sources for certain Medicaid eligible COVID 19 related expenses that long term care facilities incurred during 2020. And it won't cost the state any additional money. Thanks, Representative Warnsby and Senator Rolfus 
for their leadership as we navigate this health care crisis. And with that, I am signing House Bill 1367. Okay. We got uh, David Schumacher is also joining us uh, for questions that you might have about uh, the, the, the budget. Okay, so up first we'll go to Rachel Court with AP. Go ahead, Rachel. Governor, you and OSPI have said that schools that don't have an approved reopening plan won't be eligible for this funding. And OSPI has noted that most districts' plans will be a hybrid version due to distancing requirements. So I'm not sure if Schumacher can weigh in on this or if you have the details, but wondering if there is a bit more detail on how the funding will be allocated under a potential hybrid option that many districts may move to. Will schools with more students in classrooms be eligible, um, with more students in classrooms be eligible for a larger share of the funding or how would it break down? I don't believe that is the superintendent of public instruction's intentions. You do need to ask him about this. This is within his jurisdiction. As you know, he's a separately elected official and this, uh, this decision will be up to him. But my understanding is it would not distinguish funding based on whether you were in the classroom for five days or two days or an A and B early morning. I don't believe he intends to make such distinction. Uh, uh, but I would defer to him to articulate uh, what his intentions are in that regard. We are very happy that, um, and I have observed this firsthand, that so many schools have figured this out in a way that fits their communities. Some communities have find, found a hybrid model where you have half the students go in the morning and half go in the afternoon has been very successful for their communities and they have designed those systems. Some have found hybrid models which go on a two-day rotation with one day off during the week uh, for teachers to regroup and plan and, and, and do hygiene and the other thing. They have found that very successful. Some do split systems amongst different schools in their districts. I think what we've had is a very elegant way where we allow communities to figure out what works best for them. What they all have in common though is that when they have gone to some hybrid model, you've essentially doubled the space you have per pupil in your classroom. And that has been instrumental in being able to have the space distance between children. And it has been incredibly successful. And I, I do think, uh, you may have heard me talk about this before, but I think it, it bears repeating because parents are really wondering, is it safe to go back to school? I've, I've had any number of conversations about that in the recent weeks. And the answer is unequivocally yes, if a school embraces these protocols that have been so successful. The reason we know it's safe to go back to school, on-site instruction, is because we've demonstrated it with over 200,000 students now who have been on-site for some period of time, in excess of 175 school districts, in excess of three or 400 schools, with very minimal in-school transmission. In fact, there's been considerable research to show that our children are actually safer while they're in school than when they're on the outside. So we, we have, for parents who are interested in this, for educators who are interested in this question, I encourage them to look around at other examples around the state that has been successful. As you know, I was at uh, uh, Fir, or Fir Grove Elementary in Puyallup yesterday, Elk Ridge and Buckley, uh, looking at their district that has on-site, and they're just having incredible success. And one of the teachers, sixth grade teachers, uh, I asked her what it was like getting back in the classroom. She said, it's a million percent better. Uh, that was pretty profound, I thought, and safe. And that's what the important part is, because they've been able to use these hybrid models. Now, I say this, I hope educators look at this issue, because I know that there's been concern about the safety returning to the classroom. And what we're finding is more educators as they look at the first few grades as people are coming in, they become much more um, confident in the system when they see it in operation. I'll give an example, when I was in, at Elk Ridge talking to the, uh, the White River District, there was a teacher, I think he was a math teacher, uh, uh, don't hold me to that, but he was very concerned about this idea of coming back on site. 
But then he went over to Yakima, and he's a high school teacher, and he looked at how they were doing it in a high school in Yakima, and he said the eye-opener for him was that he realized that once you go to a hybrid and you reduce your, your population in half, you've got all this space to work with, and that's how you do it safely. Now he's a, he's a believer that this makes sense safe and efficient in his school. So in answer to your question, uh, you need to ask uh, Chris about this, but I believe we are going to succeed in the continued movement of opening our schools using hybrid systems that fit the circumstances of individual schools. No, I'm good, thank you. Uh, hi, Governor. I wanted to ask a question about um, one of your legislative proposals um, that would uh, that would create comprehensive health districts and kind of more of a regionalized approach. Um, so that proposal proposal has changed slightly, so it would create the comprehensive health districts on top of existing local health districts. And so I'm just kind of wondering your thoughts on that change, if that's something you would support, um, and if you're worried at all that that might end up causing more confusion in our public health system. I haven't looked at that recent proposal in detail, but I will be supportive of things that can move the ball to support science and good health decisions in as many communities as we have. So I'll look at that and hopefully if that will advance the cause, then I would be supportive of it. I think I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Governor. I wanted to ask you in light of the reopening that's happening of indoor dining and bowling alleys, museums, gyms, and so on and so forth, why not reopen the state capitol on a limited basis to members of the public, perhaps on a lottery basis where you would allow people inside socially distanced, perhaps in the galleries with masks on, and so long as they follow the rules, they could be in there. Why, why not do that? Well, I think we're more concerned about seeing something that happened in the insurgency at the U.S. Capitol than right now the, the, the pandemic. So I think the main concern at the moment uh, that we've been advised by the security personnel, Washington State Patrol, Guard, and other federal law enforcement that uh, there is some degree of threat and that that is the reason for uh, restrictions at the moment. Now, after that is re resolved, and I hope it will be shortly, folks will continue to think about the other pandemic uh, restrictions of, of the nature that you have suggested. But um, I think the legislature is something I'll need to talk to about that going forward. But right now we're following the security advice uh, of the State Patrol, of the National Guard, of the FBI, and others who are giving us advice about security around the Capitol. Well, just briefly, what is your latest thinking and the latest advice you're getting about the current security posture, including the presence of the fencing, which I know the House and Senate Republican leaders have said from their perspective, it's time to take that down. Uh, our advice is they have advised us that they think the current security measures are the appropriate ones given the threat level that they have assessed through multiple intelligence sources. I am hopeful that we can reduce the physical barriers uh, at a time when that security threat eases. I'm hopeful that that will come relatively shortly. But we rely on these experts uh, in this regard. We try not to intrude too much in their threat assessment, and we hope things will uh, come to a, peace, a more peaceful and civil result as the Biden administration uh, has each additional day under their belt, and those who, uh, who are lied to by a, an unmentionable person who used to hold office in our country uh, fades from view.
going to go ahead and come back. We'll try you later, Essex, if we can catch you later. Governor, I wanted to ask about the, um, the intermixing of their Climate Commitment Act bill and the culverts issues. Um, you, the bill has been reworked and now a majority of the funds are going into transportation the next 16 years. Uh, not all of it, of course. And I, I wonder if you could just talk a little about what led you to agree to this specific approach and if you could talk a little bit about why you're supporting a statewide bond to pay for um, dealing with the culverts. Well, to first off, it's an important to say the, the reason, well, there's two reasons we are investing in culverts. One, it's a constitutional obligation that the courts have made imperative. We do not have a choice in this. Neither I nor the legislators, we have to fund these culverts. It's an, it's an obligation imposed by law, and the courts have been very, very clear on this. And I believe we should follow the law of the United States and the U.S. Constitution. And second, it's necessary if we're going to have salmon for our kids to fish for. And if you don't fix these culverts, you've continued to block the spawning habitat for miles and miles of spawning habitat that are today sometimes totally blocked by, the, by these culverts. Not totally, but significantly. So there's two reasons we need to make this expenditure. I'm open to a variety of ways to do it. In talking to legislative leadership, including transportation leaders, uh, we found that this is the most tenable path to move forward to, uh, to get these jobs done. Uh, Governor, if I could jump in real quick. Yeah, good. This is David Schumacher. Uh, uh, the what the governor said, you know, we've been firmly committed to paying for culverts in this budget and, and going forward. If the legislature provides actual revenue like they're talking about, that would work. Um, I mean, this is still a legislative um, conversation that we haven't bought off yet. And the, there seems to be an idea that, that, that maybe this would go to the ballot and be decided there. And I think we're very uncomfortable with the idea of, you know, holding hostage the the culverts, you know, to a to a ballot measure. So I think, in, you know, there's lots of ways to fund culverts, and it's a high priority of ours. But I think we're going to have to see a lot more details before um, we're going to be okay with it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, well, I guess on the first one, I just wanted to now the other big change was the cap and invest uh, where the revenues are going to go. It, 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 the original version, you had left it up to the legislature um, to, uh, as a source of revenue. And now the version would provide uh, $650 million of biennium into transportation. Uh, I wonder if you might talk a little about what led to that decision to uh, support that. Change. Well, we support a transportation package commensurate to the growth and necessities and maintenance needs of the state. And we believe this is a very tenable way to, uh, to finance transportation. And so you're not only finding, financing transportation in all of its needs, including maintenance, uh, new bridges, uh, new sources of revenue for every kind of transportation, but it also at the same time reduces uh, climate change gases, and both of these uh, are important in the state of Washington, so it's a twofer. And if you're going to raise a dollar, why not solve two problems instead of just one? And we're working with the transportation chairs. We're glad that they're making progress. We think that, uh, that we're getting to the point in the legislative session where we want to really get some things down on paper that we could possibly build consensus around. So we would commend this idea uh, to the uh, legislators. All right, Governor, um, I talked about two of your big climate bills this week. Earlier, you talked about your low carbon fuel standard bill. You just talked about the Climate Commitment Act. Um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on the progress of your clean buildings bill. Um, if, and if I'm missing any other 
large uh, climate proposals. Feel free to mention those too, but I, that's the third that I can that I can think of that are kind of vital to your package. We think all of them are really sound policy. They follow the progress we've made in the last couple of years, but we know we're not done yet. And we know that using multiple tools to solve these problems is a wise approach. There's not one single panacea. There are multiple tools that we know that work. And all three of the things that we have proposed, we know that work. We have high confidence in their efficacy. So uh, we're hopeful the legislature will see it this way. And I think make progress is being made, and I'm happy about that. Um, unless there's, if there's something that you want to mention specifically about the clean buildings bill, um, anything that has changed with that one, I know there was a substitute bill. Well, uh, not a lot has changed. Um, the glaciers are still melting. Uh, fires are still burning. Texas is frozen. Iowa's underwater, and Miami's being drowned. That's all kind of continued. So the reasons for these bills to reduce the pollution that's causing all these things, kids are still getting asthma. Older folks are getting uh, cardiac problems because they're breathing diesel fumes. And every year, this gets worse. So the reason for this bill is to uh, save people's health and save people's utility bills. So instead of spending money, sending it to the utilities every month, you're buying energy and goes right out the window because it's not sealed or through your wall because it's not insulated. Uh, we want to reduce those costs that people have in the, their utility bills, including businesses. So that's the rationale for the bill, and I think it's a really sound policy. By the way, efficiency is almost always the least expensive energy source you can buy. Uh, it's been called megawatts. When you become more efficient, it's like you're generating a megawatt of, in, of, of energy. It's energy you don't waste. And uh, the science and the economics have been very, very persuasive that that's the first place you should look for new energy. I hope uh, you're hearing me now. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, first, uh, on COVID relief, how soon would a person needing rental assistance or a business needing help actually get the money in hand? David, you want to address that? Sure. So the, the money from the federal government should be here within a month. Um, but I think people will remember that in the last week or so, the governor authorized $40 million for rental assistance and $40 million for business assistance to bridge the gap between the money that we got before and the arrival of this money. So that announcement last week was exactly for this reason, is that we'll have a gap in the federal money that we needed to plug. So in answer to when the federal money actually gets into people's accounts, what's the best we can suggest, David? I think it's likely a couple of weeks. It'll depend. It's likely to depend on uh, federal guidance, which might be different in terms of the rental money versus the business money versus the public health money. You know, federal gui guidance comes at its own pace. But I would, I would imagine in the coming weeks, this money will be available. And the money that we approved last week is already available. Yes, if I could, uh, Governor, on the security issue, uh, does this QAnon talk about a Trump inauguration appearance on March 4th, the inauguration day, does that figure into the security concerns at our Capitol? I don't know. Uh, we're being, we're generally being advised by our security agencies. They're making the review. I have not asked them about the specific threats, whether that is one they're concerned about or not. So I think you need to ask the State Patrol that question uh, is the place to direct the, uh, the question. Governor, you're set to get your second dose today, you and Trudy. How excited are you about that? And how confident are you that the 
the backlog and doses will get here in time for everybody to get the second dose in the amount of time that's needed. Well, we, you know, we wish it was all done by five o'clock this afternoon. I mean, if I could snap my fingers and create, you know, five million doses and have it in people's arms by five this afternoon, I would certainly do it. Uh, we are in a race against some of these new uh, variants. It is a race, and we are being very attentive to that. I was briefed yesterday on this subject. The good news is we are in this race. We can win it. Uh, there is distinct possibility that we can staunch uh, huge surges, uh, but that remains a possibility, not a certainty. And that's why it's really important for us all to continue wearing masks, to continue socially distancing, to follow uh, the advice in our business guidance. It's absolutely imperative. That is the things that gives us a chance to win this race, to get the vaccine into enough arms to staunch the, the variants so that they don't uh, cause huge spikes. So I really do want to use this opportunity to urge people to remain observant, remain committed. We cannot let our foot off the pedal here or these variants could eat us alive, literally. So it's good news we're getting this vaccine. It's good news that it is fairly significantly increasing now every week. We have a, a hopeful new vaccine, a one-dose vaccine in the next several weeks. We hope we'll will uh, uh, show its efficacy and its safety. That could happen in the next couple of weeks. So there's a lot of good news out here that we will be able to avoid uh, subsequent surges, but only if all of us remain committed uh, as we have been. As far as how Trudy and I feel, we're very, uh, very appreciative of the geniuses who have created this. This is, I heard uh, President Biden describe this as a miracle today. And I got it for all our frustration, which is enormous, having to look around and trying to find doses, this, doses, doses, this is frustrating. But it is, it is a miracle that we have this opportunity. And I'm, I'm very appreciative of the, the people who have given us this miracle. Yeah, I would like to make a final word, if I may. Um, I can just share with you what I'm hearing, what the, what the uh, public is the one of the top two questions I have received in the last several weeks. Obviously, many, many questions about the vaccine. But there is a second subject where people are desperate for information, and that is what has happened with schools that have opened with on-site instruction. Have they had enormous surges in the, the virus, or have they not? Turns out they have not. Uh, are they functioning well? Have many of them had to close down permanently and go back to remote? Or have they not? It turns out they have not. They've been extremely successful. One thing I will share with you is there is intense interest in this issue. Uh, I, you know, you, you get to decide how to do your jobs, but I will tell you it would be very valuable to many, many people if you can share legitimate, honest, truthful information about what has happened in 175 plus other school districts that have opened up their schools. I think that could be very useful in people's individual decision making so they can decide whether their children want to stay in remote or whether they want to go into an on-site uh, uh, experience. So I appreciate your help in that regard. And with that, thank you, please be well.